Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh my dear brothers and sisters and welcome to this final bit of the building that we are wanting to complete but because of shortness of funds we aren't able to complete this part of the building now this top bit of the building is also going to be a studio a rooftop studio but as you can see it doesn't have any supporting lines to, for us to be able to put windows or glass here we don't have any flooring we don't have much on this floor and this floor needs to be completed inshallah before Muharram so that we can bring you live content from Bain al Haramain, al Sharifain, as well as our other studios. Now, my dear brothers and sisters, we are in need of your donations. We are in need of your help. We are in need of you laying a brick in your name in this building. This is not my building. This is not the cameraman's building. This is not anyone's building. It's your building. You guys are the ones that continue to support Imam Hussein TV day by day, week by week month after month, year after year, and inshallah, decade after decade, you will continue to support this organization who has the biggest capacity to reach the most people around the world. And inshallah, through your generous donations, through you laying a brick in your name, we can finish off this project and bring you Imam al Hussein alayhi salam live from the holy city of Karbala. September the 11th, July the 7th, bombings in Syria, suicide bombings virtually everywhere. And everyone seemingly points this back to the Holy Quran because they say that the justification of these bombers or of those who have been involved in killing, for example, non-Muslims in different parts of the world is because of the Quran. If the Muslims were actually ready to scrap the Quran or to finally stop in their discussions of certain sections of the Holy Quran, then you wouldn't have these issues that you see in the world today. And there is a reality that every time one looks in the news and you hear about a particular suicide bombing, you always associate it with a Muslim. Or if you hear, for example, of a YouTube video that's out in relation to a beheading by a member of a Muslim terrorist organization. Now, yes, Muslims may always argue that, look, when you see, for example, the Ku Klux Klan, you're not going to say all Christians subscribe to that particular worldview. Or when you look at, for example, the Irish Republican Army, you're not going to say that every single person who's a Catholic subscribes to that worldview. <coughs> or if I look at the Tamil Tigers, for example, I'm not going to say every single person subscribes to that worldview. But seemingly, if it's Al-Qaeda, or if it's ISIS, or if it's any of the organizations that have used the Muslim slogans, that means that all Muslims subscribe to this. Now, I know that there are certain non-Muslims out there who definitely will not generalize. They'll always say that, look, what's being said by these people is not something that we agree with. But we can't really shy away from this Quranically. Because while we love to tell the world that Islam means peace, 
A famous comedian once remarked that yes, a peace here, a peace there, and a peace everywhere. Meaning that when you're talking about peace in relation to the religion of Islam and you look within the Holy Quran, you see within the Holy Quran there are certain verses that you hope your Muslim friends don't get a hold of. Because when a verse in the Holy Quran says something like what the verses we're going to discuss tonight say, such as kill them wherever you see them, how then does that match my discussion or my understanding of the religion, especially the way that I disseminate the teachings of this religion? That's not to deny that other religions don't have similar verses. I'm not going to shy away from discussing the war verses or the violent verses or the killing verses in the Quran. I'm not going to shy away from those. But you cannot tell me that a person needs a religious text for them to justify an action. There are people who had no belief in God who killed millions in Russia. There are people who had no belief in God who killed millions in China. They didn't have a religious text called the Quran or the Bible or the Torah or the Gita. But they still ended up killing millions. A person can abuse any text they feel like. For the love of God, someone might even make their own text and make people follow it. This is my struggle and I want you to all understand it. This is my worldview and I want you to all believe it. For a person to suggest that the Quran is the only text that has verses which talk about war, violence, killing, one only has to look in the Torah, in the Bible and in the Gita. Because no one's going to ever associate Judaism or Christianity or Hinduism with violence. Violence is only associated with Islam. If you look, for example, in the book of Deuteronomy, or you look in the book of Numbers, or you look at Krishna's discussion with Arjun about the Dharmic duty of fighting, nobody would ever associate the likes of Christ or the likes of Krishna with a sword and going around and killing people <clears throat> or ordering that people should be slayed. I'll never forget in the book of Luke. If I was to say the following two lines, I guarantee you that most people would think that these two lines are from the Quran. All those who do not want me to rule them. Bring them to me and slay them in my name. All those who don't want me to rule over them, bring them to me and slay them in my name. Who says that? Muhammad? Because the whole medieval Europe used to teach us that Muhammad is the one who spread his religion by the sword. Muhammad is the one whose soldiers were going around killing people. Those who don't want me to rule over them, bring them to me and slay them in my name is Jesus talking. Jesus? Nabi Isa السلام, is meant to be the man of forgiveness, man of peace, man of love. Yet Luke 19.27 is saying to me, they don't want me to rule over their name. Say Jesus has a second coming. You don't want me to rule over you. Bring them to me. We slay them. Am I going to generalize on all Christians out there because I've taken a passage from Deuteronomy? Do I generalize on all the Jewish community because of a passage from the book of Numbers? Do I generalize on all the Hindu community because of Krishna's discussion about Dharmic duty? Do I generalize on all Muslims because of the behavior of a few? But the non-Muslim and even the ex-Muslim has a point when they say, well, at least address the verses. Because I do believe that the majority of Muslims out there either read the Arabic without understanding what they're reading, read the Arabic without bothering to ask what's the context of this ayah. If I see a particular ayah of the Holy Quran, 
I have to ask, what's the context of this? Now, I know some non-Muslims say, that's a cop-out. Because all you're going to do is you're just going to try and show that it wasn't a particular context. Look, I live in the 21st century, and I've seen certain countries where one man's freedom fighter is another man's terrorist. Another man's terrorist is someone else's freedom fighter. At the end of the day, when I'm going to look at, for example, the invasion of a certain country in a thousand years' time, I still need to read the context. Why this invasion took place? Was there a treaty? Was the treaty ratified? Was there a particular group of people who ratified it? Was there the possibility of peace? Was there the possibility of forgiveness? What if people didn't break that treaty? Was there collateral damage, collateral killings? Was it killing all civilians? Isn't that true? Isn't that part of our discussions? That when we see people dying in Iraq, the first question I'm going to ask, was that a military base or did you go all in? Most of the discussions about war in the world will ask the companies that were employed to supply weapons, did you target the military base and did you offer the chance of treaty of peace? Therefore, when I look at verses in the Quran, it's unfair for someone to say to me that the verses in Surah Al-Baqarah or Surah Al-Anfal or Surah Al-Tawbah, you are just going to justify them by using context no i won't i'm just doing what rational convention does rational convention dictates that when you look at any situation that exists between two warring communities try and find ways of reconciling try and see whether certain treaties or covenants have been broken who's broken them have they plundered other people's lives have they killed innocent civilians let's they take them to a high court that high court may result in certain people from nazi germany being executed for war crimes you can't bat an eyelid about those who were executed because of what they did at Auschwitz. A person says, kill them all, execute them all. But when you say that, then why is there a problem if the Quran talked about the same type of perpetrators in their context? Was there a Hitler in Mecca? Yes, there was. Was there a Hitler in Medina? Yes, there was. Were there people who were literally executing innocent men and women, for example? If you're saying that what happened with Auschwitz dictates that a certain body can decide what happens to the perpetrators of these crimes, what if that body, according to us, is revelation from the Lord? Therefore, when I'm looking within the Quran, and just a disclaimer, by the way, I, ju I just want to put a disclaimer here. I find it very interesting how many people hate violence but don't mind buying computer games for their kids which are violent so if there's a quranic verse or a biblical verse that discusses a particular violent verse a violent concept it's like disgusting these books should be burnt what's the name of the latest game where you go around killing everyone call of mashallah what a name Call of duty, mashallah. The duty is to go around killing people. That's the call of duty. Many kids in households, Muslim and non-Muslims, are bought these gifts. So why, when I discuss a religious text, they say, but oh, the religious text people will, will uh, be indoctrinated by. Have you seen when a child plays a computer game, how long they stay on the screen? Therefore, don't have a double standard. Let's agree that there are texts which are contextual. Let's agree that not everyone called Muslim is necessarily educated, literate, or someone whose intentions are pure. Let's agree that we can look at these verses and seek to understand them one by one. And what's very clear is that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, becomes or announces his prophethood at the age of 40. And he dies at the age of 63. So 23 years, he's a prophet publicly in his announcement. The first war he ever engages in is 15 years into the 23. Because when you look in the Quran, I think even though the Meccans, Abu Sufyan, Abu Lahab, Abu Jahl, Walid ibn al-Mughira, Utbah ibn Rabi'ah, even though these people are oppressing his people, there's a group of verses in the Quran that begin by telling him, turn the other cheek. You know that concept? Reply with that which is better. If they are attacking you, try and turn the other cheek. 
if you look at these groups of verses, let's let's try and begin with uh, Surah 41, probably 41 from about 32 onwards. Yeah, Surah 41 verse 34. Let's go to 41, 34. Um, surah 41 verse 34 is a very interesting surah. Okay, we call it Hamim. Okay, Surah 41. Um, verse 34 and the Quran says Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim وَلَا تَسْتَوِي الْحَسَنَةُ وَلَا السَّيِّئَةُ Equals You can't put good and evil as equal. Do you agree? اِدْفَعْ بِالَّتِ هِيَ أَحْسَنُ You can't put good and evil as being equal Repel their evil with that which is best. فَإِذَا الَّذِي بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَهُ عَدَاوَةٌ كَأَنَّهُ وَلِيٌّ حَمِيمٌ Between, for what happens between you and the one who has enmity with you, it will be like they become a warm friend. Maybe, inshallah, inshallah, you never know. The try and reply to them in that which is best. Maybe they come to you as a warm friend at the end. Maybe they change their conception. Maybe they change their philosophy. Another ayah, Surah Al-Ma'idah has an interesting ayah. Surah 5 verse 13. In Surah Al-Ma'idah verse number 13, there's this um, very interesting discussion that takes place. Again, about this area of Mecca. Mecca, the Prophet, is, is, is trying to to do that which is better they're bringing um although ma'ida is a later verse but you, you you still see that sometimes it's the covenants that are being broken and that's what's causing a lot of their of their problem and the quran says to him fa'fu anhum at the end of the ayah in surah al-ma'idah fa'fu anhum wasfah inna allah yuhibbul muhsineen so try and forgive them and try and pass over what they're saying to you. Um, also, another early ayah in Mecca, Surah 73, verse number 10. Again, there is this aim at the beginning of his risala, at the beginning of his message. There is this aim to try and find some sort of peaceful reconciliation, which, by the way, I don't think changes very much. Um, throughout his message. But you look in verse number 10, وَاصْبِرْ عَلَى مَا يَقُولُونَ وَهْجُرْهُمْ هَجْرًا Jamila, Be patient with the words at, that they're attacking you with and try and avoid them with a particular avoidance that is um, a beautiful avoidance. So try and look for peace. And even a few surahs later, in surah 88, surah 88 of the Quran, verse number uh, 22, Again, we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling the Prophet, and you all know these verses, obviously, <clears throat> when the Quran says, إِنَّمَا أَنْتَ مُذَكِّرْ لَسْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ بِمُسَيْطِرْ You are someone who reminds them, but you cannot compel them. So at the beginning, when Abu Lahab and Abu Jahal and Abu Sufyan and so on, when they're attacking the Muslims, they killed, for example, Yasser, the father of Ammar, Sumayya, the mother of Ammar. They were torturing Bilal. There were many of the Sahaba who had to leave Mecca and go and live in Africa because of how much torture they were facing. The Quran was telling the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, try and find forgiveness. Try and be patient. You know, and even some people, because some people say, oh, that was only because he never had many supporters. That's the only reason he never raised his sword. In the first battle of the religion of Islam, the battle of Badr, did he have many supporters? No. Why then did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the beginning in Mecca not tell him, get your sword? Because the aim of this whole message wasn't that we go with a sword and put it on people's neck. The aim was that we somehow try and show the message and if they treat us badly, we try and reply with that which is better. Yes, people look later on at the likes of, uh, before that on Christ, Gandhi and others who called for a form of standing up against those who were attacking you by turning the other cheek. Fasfah, in a way, okay, is to turn the other cheek in reality. Because you're trying to say that, you know what, we don't want to just enter a fight. Because, you know, sometimes someone might say to you, this guy's behaving badly with you. Go and fight them. Tell them, let's meet somewhere. Sometimes you're like, no, you know what, let me turn the other cheek. Maybe their heart softens, you know. Like how Habil maybe tried with Qabil, okay. 
So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, the Prophet Muhammad, migrates from Mecca to Medina. And when he migrates from Mecca to Medina, listen, you guys are trying to attack me in Mecca. I'm going to leave. Baba, I'm leaving. Anna, I'm living in Wembley. You guys in Wembley don't want me to live here. I'm going to go and live in Romford. And because I'm going to go and live in Romford, leave me alone. I'm not going to come near you guys anymore. For the love of God, give me my Hurriya. You've forced us to leave our homes because we said, La ilaha illallah. You forced us to leave our homes. Give me my freedom. He moves to Medina. What do they do? They now come on the outskirts of Medina. And they start trying to find ways of going into Medina. Trying to find ways of raiding Medina. Of course, the Prophet, peace be upon his family, this idea that he only had a defensive war. Firstly, he had preemptive strikes as well. Because look, if someone's coming on your borders, any country will be like, excuse me, you know that ship of yours, 170 feet long, what's it doing in our shores? Oh, sorry, we're just fishing. No, no, you, there's, there's lines which you have to draw. You can't come into my area. And so what they were trying to do, they were trying to find ways of getting into Medina. And so the prophet, what would he do, peace be upon his family? He'd tell the people that, listen, try your hardest to stop their caravans because their caravans are full of weapons trade to try and make them stronger against us when he raided one of their caravans abu sufyan sent a message to mecca when, what was the message uh, arabs i've got news for you your caravans have been raided you tell an arab his stock has been raided forget about it that's my ras mal that's all my high and you've taken it from me abu jahl said that's it we fight them now question how long are you going to take this for because this is a group of gangs and unless you stand up to them, they're going to keep bullying you. And so eventually the Quran revealed to him, now you're allowed to defend yourself. Now you're allowed to ask your companions to defend themselves. And what you see is the beginning of a mobilization in Medina, never in Mecca. But in Medina, you see the beginning of a mobilization where the main ayah which begins the rationale for a country, a state, a city, a group to defend themselves, now is the beginning of it. Surah 22, verse number 39 of the Quran, Surah Al-Hajj, Surah Al-Hajj, ayah 39, verse 39 of Surah Al-Hajj. This is the verse which gives you the rationale of why Muslims were allowed to fight. It says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Udhina lilladhina yuqataluna bi'annahum zulimu. Now, permission. Udhina lilladhina yuqataluna bi'annahum zulimu. The permission has been given for the believers to now finally fight because they've been oppressed. Islam's not a religion that says you just go around to anyone and you're like, well, you know what? Because of your identity, I want to oppress you. We had an issue with ISIS simply because it was on the Hawi, on the identity that they were killing people. Whereas here the Quran says no. Quran says permission has been given to the believers to fight because they've been oppressed. وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَىٰ نَصْرِهِمْ لَقَادِيرٍ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will look after their victory. الَّذِينَ أُخْرِجُوا مِنْ دِيَارِهِمْ الدِّيَارِ بِيُوتْهُمْ Okay, their houses, let's say. بِغَيْرِ حَقٍ إِلَّا أَنْ يَقُولُوا رَبُّنَ اللَّهِ You know why they were kicked out of their houses from Mecca? Because they said our Lord is Allah. That's it. That's it. Did they rape a girl there? No. Did they molest a girl there? No. Did they steal from anyone? No. What was their crime? La ilaha illallah. That's it. That's it. Only one crime. Illa yaqulu rabbun Allah. And then the Quran says something very interesting here. وَلَوْ لَا دَفْعُ اللَّهِ النَّاسَ بَعْضَهُمْ بِبَعْضٍ لَهُدِّمَتْ صَوَامِعُ وَبِيَعٌ وَصَلَوَاتٌ وَمَسَاجِدٌ يُذْكَرُ فِيهَا اسْمُ اللَّهِ كَثِيرًا This is a wonderful ayah because it says we've given permission to the Muslims to defend themselves. Rational convention. Anyone who people are attacking their home has a right to defend himself. The only crime they did, why they were kicked out of Mecca, this group of muhajirun, the only reason was because they said, La ilaha illallah. That's it. And if it wasn't for us telling them to stand up, 
there wouldn't be a single soma, sawami, bia, salawat, masajid. I ask you, what's the sawami? Let's say monastery, shayfil monks. The monk, rahib, for example, they go and live in a monastery. Okay. Bia. What's bia? Let's say churches. Salawat, synagogue. Masjid, mosque. If this religion is for Muslims, why are you defending synagogues? Why are you defending churches? Do you know that over 80% of the Muslim world does not know that synagogues are in the Quran? Because the Muslim world has no relation with the Quran. If you ask the Muslim, go and speak to someone Jewish now in London. Tell them about synagogues in the Quran. How many do you think will know where the synagogue is mentioned in the Quran? Second question, why do we care about a synagogue or a church? Well, I'm a Muslim. I care about a mosque, masjid. Why do I care about the kanisa? <coughs> why do I care about the synagogue or the church? Any place. Where a person is calling La ilaha illallah, you have to go and defend. You may have a difference on the meaning of La ilaha illallah. That doesn't stop a Pope from sitting in your house in Najaf. ISIS, what did they do? Dawaish. Noon, Nasrani. Ra, Rawafid. Quran said, المساجد, wherever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is being worshipped, you have to defend. Why do I say all of this? What if a Muslim is fighting a Christian or Jew? If a Muslim is fighting someone Christian or fighting someone Jewish, what then happens? This is a point I want you to all think about. Let's make something very clear here. Islam doesn't want Muslims killing. Let's be very clear here. Islam doesn't say, you know what, it's very normal for you to taste blood. Even Islam says it's makruh to have a job like a butcher. al gassab is something makruh. Because al gassab finds it normal to be around blood. Of course, we all need our local butcher. But it's not a job which is highly recommended. You won't find a hundred butchers in one road. You find supermarkets everywhere. You find barbers everywhere. But you won't find butchers everywhere. Not something highly recommended. Islam didn't want you to be used to blood. Yes, what Muslims became is a different story altogether. Islam didn't want that. If you look in the Quran, Surah 6, verse, verse 151 of the Quran, Surah 6, Surah Al-An'am, verse 151. If you look at verse 151, God makes it clear. He doesn't want us to be that nation. When he tells us these Ten Commandments. You know how people have Ten Commandments? There are Ten Commandments here. Say, O Prophet of God, come. I will recite unto you what your Lord has forbidden to you. You don't associate with him anything. And to your parents, you're good. And you don't kill your children out of fear of poverty. We provide for you and them. And you do not go near shameful deeds. And that you do not kill another soul which God has forbidden. But it does say, except to achieve justice. Do you agree? وَلَا تَقْرَبُ الْفَوَاحِشَ مَا ظَهَرَ مِنْهَا وَمَا بَطَنْ وَلَا تَقْتُلُ النَّفْسَ الَّتِي حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا بِالْحَاقِ Islam says you don't kill another soul except for justice. Now here's a problem, by the way. Here's a problem. What's the problem? Whose killing is just? Big problem. I cannot deny Bin Laden says, who I killed is just. Abu Bakr Baghdadi says, who I killed was just. Sayyid Fulan says, who I killed was just. Sheikh Fulan says, who I killed is just. I cannot deny when a non-Muslim says, anyone can take these out of context. I can't deny. I can't deny. In reality, there are over a billion Muslims in the world, and it takes one to say, well, in my interpretation, the Shia are the ones who you can kill with haq. In my opinion, the Sufi, kill them. In my opinion, the Alawis. In my opinion, the Ahmadis. In my opinion, everybody can take these and give their own conclusion. 
But the reality is Islam didn't want us to be a nation where we found killing normal. When in the Quran, therefore, someone goes to Surah Al-Baqarah verse 190, there's, there's two chapters of the Quran that have violent verses. There's a number of verses, but there's two chapters that have violent, violent verses. Surah Al-Baqarah, Ayah 190, 190, is probably the most famous of them. Okay? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. وَقَاتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ قَاتِلُوا Get ready, go out there and fight. Islam is a religion of peace. Here's the Quran. And then someone's like, bro, you know what? is not that peaceful. Okay. Kill those who, or fight those who fight you. Pretty clear. Do you agree? Those who come and fight you, you got to fight them. The Meccans for years were in the ascendancy. They had bullied the Muslims. They had tortured the Muslims. They had killed the Muslims. And here we have a situation where the Muslims finally are getting stronger. And the Muslims who are living in Medina want to go back to Mecca. And this discussion is about that period of Hajj where the Muslims want to come back to doing Hajj finally. Yep. <coughs> you know, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, how many Hajj did he do in his lifetime? One. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa went on one hajj only. Why? Ya Rasulullah. There are some of us who have been hajj two times. There's three times. Eight times. Fifteen. A'immat ahlil bayt sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Twenty. Twenty-five. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa went to hajj once. Because all these years, he left Mecca. They never let him come back to Mecca. When did they give a hint that he was going to come back to Mecca? When they signed the Hudaybiyah peace treaty. <coughs> Britain has signed treaties. America has signed treaties. Canada has signed treaties. Pakistan has signed treaties. India has signed treaties. Everybody signed treaties. When we want to discuss their treaties, okay. If I want to discuss the Quranic treaty, no, you're not allowed. The Quran's violent. Treaty of Hudaybiyah was what? Was that you're going to be allowed to do Umrah the following year. If we did Umrah, what happens if we go there and the Meccans get their swords out to kill us? I'm going Umrah. The Meccans have said you can come. What if we all go, all of a sudden, in Masjid al-Haram, everything comes out. قَاتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ الَّذِينَ يُقَاتِلُونَكُمْ those who fight you, you fight them. Permission has been given. Walakin. Finish the ayah, ya Habibi, ya CNN, ya Fox News. Finish the ayah. And do not transgress the limits. When I go there and someone's fighting me, can I just say, well, their kids are bad. I'm going to kill their kids as well. No. Uh, that's his wife. So I'm going to torture him more. Let me kill the wife. No. They're Christians. Those are monks, hermits. Kill them. No. Trees, cut them down. No. Wala ta'tadu means don't transgress. Khalas. They fight you. You fight that person. Not you take it out on his family. Because you know, sometimes you watch these films. The guy goes and kills his enemy and then kills the family, the kids, the tribe. وَلَا تَعْتَدُوا was to make a line and draw a line. That when these people kill you or fight you, you fight them. وَلَا تَعْتَدُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ Important point here. إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ People say to me, Allah loves everyone. What a load of nonsense. Once I was asked by somebody, they said to me, this was unbelievable. They said to me, does Allah love all his creations? I'm like, yeah. They said all, I'm like, yeah. They said, so Allah loves Yazid. Said, what do you mean Allah loves Yazid? I said, well, Allah loves all his creations. So if he loves all his creations, Yazid is a creation. So Allah... Have you not read the ayahs of Inna Allah la yuhibbu? 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran many times will mention to us, but there are those I do not love. Amongst them are those who transgress. You can have a Muslim ruler transgress against Muhammad's own grandchildren, sallallahu alayhi wa Do you agree? A Muslim supposed ruler who some say Yazid radiallahu anh, transgresses not look if I've got a problem with Imam al-Hussein what why are these kids being killed why are these kids have been plundered why are these ladies have been tortured let's not beat around the bush my dear brothers and sisters at home Islam as a religion is beautiful within 50 years of the death of the man who bought it it was the most disgusting place 50 years after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa died this ayah was forgotten Okay, no problem. Well, Quran says, <coughs> Don't transgress. How is it that Rasulullah is grandchildren, granddaughters? You know, by the way, there are many people who are not Shia in the Muslim world. They haven't got a clue what happened to the grandchildren of Rasulullah in Karbala 50 years after he died, or after Karbala in Kufa, or after Kufa in the land of Sham. Many don't know. <coughs> many don't know. There are many of our viewers who are wonderful people. They look at us Shia and they're like, why do you guys cry? for Imam al we cry because of what we think is the feeling of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi for what happened to his grandchildren. Wouldn't you cry if your grandchildren were punched and slapped and kicked and whipped? This is transgressions. These ayahs, we took them out on Christians, on Jews, on atheists. These ayahs apply the most to who? Apply the most to our history, our History which in some parts is disgusting, really. It's disgusting. The idea was when someone shows me, Sayyidina, qatilu fi sabilillah al-Quran, where is the where is the peace? Where is the salam? Where is the silm? I'm like Habibi, those who fight me, <coughs> I've been given permission, but I cannot do what? It means that don't take it further. I'm going to find someone who's not paying zakat to the Khalifa. He, Malik bin Nuwayra, doesn't pay zakat to the Khalifa of the time. Get him, behead him, and then sleep with his wife the same night. Okay, you have a problem with Malik bin Nuwayra. Why are you beheading? No, not just beheading, cooking food on the head. But you can't say these things. Do you know where the problem also is? When you have Shia scholars who are like, our problems are because of the Umayyads. Our problems are because of Bani Umayyah, al khatta al-Amawi. Before that, someone gave Fatima Zahra a big problem about Fedak. As well. where, where? Anyway, so the Quran says, وَقَاتِلُوا فِي سَبِلِ اللَّهِ الَّذِينَ يُقَاتِلُونَكُمْ وَلَا تَعْتَدُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ ال... But then look at the next ayah. وَاقْتُلُوهُمْ Allahu Akbar. حَيْثُ ثَقِفْتُمُوهُمْ وَخْرِجُوهُمْ مِنْ حَيْثُ أَخْرَجُوكُمْ Listen. Does, am I going to tell my friend Islam's original peace? This is not very peaceful. Do you agree? Slay them wherever you find them. Drive them away from where they drove you away. They, if you've come to Mecca, and if they end up after having agreed with you, come to Umrah, here's your visa. And then I come there and suddenly they ambush me and kill me. Do I not have the right to do to them what they've done to me? They were the ones kicking you out. Come back and say no more of that arrogance. Why? Well, fitna to ashaddu min al qatl. Mischief is more grievous than that slaughter. Someone like this, the bully, you let him stay. Why did Imam al Hussein alayhi salam decide that a man like me doesn't pledge allegiance to a man like him? Why? Why did Imam al Hussein say that? Because if I let this person stay, al fitna ashaddu min al qatl, this person's mischief will continue. 
And don't tell me Islam, oh, that's barbaric of Islam. How many countries in the world go around? We are the police of freedom for countries. We have to help you in your wars. We will save you from your dictator. So if you could do it, then you're admitting that it's rational convention. Masjid al-Haram is very sacred. You're not allowed to even kill a mosquito if it comes to you in your ihram. صحيح? However, they fight you there, your permission is being given. If they fight you there, the permission has been given to you. فَإِنْ قَاتَلُوكُمْ فَاقْتُلُوهُمْ كَذَلِكَ جَزَاءُ الْكَافَرِينَ So here, what is the context? I have signed a treaty with these people that I could come with a Umrah visa, a Tawni visa. And I've come for visa. I get there and what do they do to me straight away? If they come and fight me, permission has been given. That I'm now allowed to because in Mecca we were saying to you what? Fasfah, fa'fu. <laughs> now we're saying no. No more because this fitna ashaddu min al qatl. However, verse 192. فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ But if they desist, <laughs> then know that Allah is forgiving. Okay? وَقَاتِلُوهُمْ حَتَّى لَا تَكُونَ فِتْنَةٌ وَيَكُونَ الدِّينُ لِلَّهِ فَإِنْ انْتَهُوا فَلَا عُدْوَانَ إِلَّا عَلَى الظَّالِمِينَ You fight so that you make sure that this dissension, this nonsense, where you can't grant visas to people because they believe in God, <coughs> that's eradicated. No more. It's not going to happen. And that those people who don't show any hostility, don't oppress them. This is important. When I go back, I see a mushrik, I see a mushrik. I see a mushrik with takabbur, I see a mushrik who's a bit more of a mukhlas. Why should I hurt this person? Because these people in his family are arrogant. What's this person done wrong to me? So, the first group of ayat where people say, Quran, qatiluhum, uqtuluhum, is Surah Al Baqarah. Even similar to these and arguably more vicious. Surah 9, verse number. First, well, right at the beginning of Surah 9, actually. Surah Tawbah. Surah Bara'at. Okay? What's the only Surah in the Quran that does not begin with Bismillah Rahman Rahim? My dear brothers at home, this quiz question. Which Surah of the Quran is the only Surah that doesn't begin with Bismillah Rahman Rahim? In the name of God, the most. I don't know how to translate it. Beneficent, merciful, most kind. So many different translations. <coughs> Let's just say basically in the name of God, the most kind, the most merciful. If you want to have it as a very basic level translation, there's only one surah that God does not begin with mercy. And that's this surah, surah 9. Now why? It goes to show you, by the way, that Islam, for those who say Islam is all about peace and love and mercy. No, there's times you have to dissociate from the enemies. Because in our communities, people are like, you know, Islam is not a religion of... Uh, of, of hate. So if there are people who oppressed Ahl al-Bayt, you shouldn't hate those people. You should just, you know, just don't talk about them. Okay, so if Islam is not a religion of dissociation, why has God got a whole surah that doesn't begin with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim? The norm is Rahmah, but there's an exception. And the exception is Surah 9 of the Quran. Surah 9 is, 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 a, is, a, is a major moment. Why is it a major moment? Because you know what's happened? You know we signed that treaty that if I come for Umrah, you guys aren't going to do anything. They didn't do anything. They let them come for Umrah. It was cool. But they couldn't take it that these guys were coming to Umrah peacefully. So you know what the Meccans did? One night, the Banu Bakr were supported by the Quraysh to kill the Banu Khuza'a Muslims. In the middle of the night, they ambushed and slayed them all. In the Hudaybiyah peace treaty, we had made an agreement that there will be no war for 10 years, no killing for 10 years. You signed and we signed. And we were more powerful than you, but our Prophet, because of his merciful nature, didn't exploit his power. In the middle of the night, you come, the Banu Bakr of the Quraysh, kill the Banu Khuza'a Muslim. The only surah that doesn't begin with God's mercy is this one because it was enough. That's it. No more. No more. And you know what's no more? We're going to go back to Mecca. And those people who've ambushed are going to be responsible. You'd think that they'd be responsible in the sense of what? That they'll all get killed. No. Even then Allah still displays mercy even though there's no rahmah at the beginning of the surah. 
But we're going to go back to Mecca. And from now on, you know what's going to happen? Hajj is going to start. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals this chapter to the Prophet. Prophet tells Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr, go towards the people of Mecca. And over there, in the middle of that whole Hajj period, announce it. Abu Bakr leaves on his, he's just left. He's going from Medina to Mecca. Jibrail comes to the Prophet, peace be upon him, and says, the Lord has instructed that either you go or someone who's your nafs. The Prophet turns around, oh Ali, you go. Either you or your nafs. Someone who's like yourself. Imam Ali Islam went, got to Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr, give me, I will announce the revelation. Abu Bakr said, Abu Hassan, what are you doing here? <laughs> he said, Jibrail came and he said that only a prophet, like the prophet, or his nafs can go and announce this revelation. Imam Ali got it. He went. Now you imagine the scene. Every one of these Meccans, old enemies of Imam Ali alayhi salam, they're all doing their tawaf. They were blatantly doing tawaf naked, by the way. Blatant. Yeah, people today, <coughs> they do tawaf and they get harassed and so on. Imagine Arabs just going around naked in a, in near the Kaaba. It's jahl, jahl, jahl. Ignorance. Imam Ali has to go there and there's a lot of people who've been waiting for Ali ibn Abi Talib to be alone. Because they got revenge missions on Badr and Uhud and Khaddaq and Khaybar. They just can't wait for him to be alone. Can you imagine <coughs> going into an area where there's certain people who can't wait to get you because you've done something to their brother years back and now you've actually, you're like, I'm going to come into that estate myself and stand there. And not only am I going to stand there, I'm going to like, none of you are going to do tawaf naked. Next year, there's not going to be a mix of mushrik and mu'min here. You guys can never come near the Kaaba again. This is ours. The, uh, the surah begins. Bara'atum min Allahi wa rasulil ladina ahattum min al-mushrikeen. A declaration of dissociation from God and his prophet to those who you made the treaty with. This declaration gives those people four months to get ready and get out. فَسِيحُ فِي الْأَرْضِ أَرْبَعَةَ أَشْهُرٍ وَاعْلَمُوا أَنَّكُمْ غَيْرُ مُعْجِزِ اللَّهِ وَأَنَّ اللَّهَ مُخْزِ الْكَافِرِينَ You got four months left. Do you know what's beautiful about this four months? They've just killed the whole tribe, but we'll still give them time. Most people, what do they do? Next day, bomb Baghdad. Eviction notice, ahsant. Eviction notice, but even eviction notice might give you two weeks. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's eviction notice gives you four months. <coughs> of course, different opinion when these four months begin. Because we're talking hajj. So we're talking, is it shawwal? Is it dhil-qa'da? Is it dhil-hijjah? There's difference of opinion in the mufassirun. But you've been given four months. وَأَذَانٌ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ لَلنَّاسِ يَوْمَ الْحَجِّ الْأَكْبَرِ Hajj al-Akbar, either the day of Arafah or the day of the sacrifice, okay? Adhan, announcement. Who's making the announcement? Ali, son of Abu Talib. In front of everybody in Mecca. You all know me, don't you? You remember me? Listen, I'll tell you something. I personally would never be able to do something like that. Go into an estate and be like, a state of all my enemies and their sons. All the wahush, all the waskhin, all the sons of zina of Meccan society. All of them in one area. Just to add. Anyway, I won't add because I have to be on good behavior in my lectures. And he makes it clear to all of them. Adhan min Allah. There is an adhan announcement from Allah and His Prophet. Allah dissociates from you polytheists. You've troubled us, the Muslims, because of their belief in God for this long. No more. No more. You know, I dissociate. All other surahs, when you were troubling, I was still saying, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. No more. But, فَإِن 
فإن تبتم فهو خير لكم if you repent this is the beauty they've killed but if they do tawbah it's good for you no problem وإن توليتم then what happens فاعلموا أنكم غير معجز الله وبشر الذين كفروا بعذاب أليم you do tawbah it's good for you you don't you get ready but there, I'll ask you a question. Banu Bakr killed Banu Khuza'ah. But there's other tribes in Mecca. I know there's other names given of tribes in the Tafasir, Kenan, and so on. But there's other tribes in Mecca. People from other tribes who never killed, do they deserve to be killed? No. Look at verse 4. إِلَّا الَّذِينَ أَحَدْتُمْ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَنْقُصُوكُمْ شَيْئًا وَلَمْ يُظَاهِرُوا عَلَيْكُمْ أَحَدًا فَأَتِمُّوا إِلَيْهِمْ أَحْدَهُمْ إِلَى مُدَّتُهِمْ سبحان الله Those with whom you entered a pact, you made a treaty. They did not break that treaty. Let them go. No, they've done nothing wrong. Because you know the next ayah, verse 5. فَإِذًا سَلَخَ الْأَشْرُ الْحُرُمُ فَاقْتُلُوا الْمُشْرِكِينَ حَيْثُ وَجَدْتُمُوهُمْ وَخُذُوهُمْ وَاقْعُدُوا وَاقْعُدُوا لَهُمْ كُلَّ مَرْصَدٍ That's a violent verse. <laughs> That's violent. Abu <laughs> Abir, huh? this verse is a wahshi verse. It's wahshi. فَإِذًا سَلَخَ الْأَشْرُ الْحُرُمُ فَاقْتُلُوا الْمُشْرِكِينَ حَيْثُ وَجَدْتُمُوهُمْ Listen, if I tell my friend, bro, you know, Islam is such a peaceful religion. He's like, bro, uh, verse 5 of Surah 9. Uh, kill the polytheists wherever you see them. Don't just kill them, by the way. Besiege them, lie wait in them for every ambush. I have to show verse 4 before it. And I have to show verse 6 after it. Because at the end of verse 5, it says, فَإِنْ تَابُوا but if they repent, أَقَامُوا الصَّلَاءَ آتُوا الزَّكَاةَ Then what do you do? فَخَلُّوا سَبِيلَهُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورٌ آه. So in the verses about violence in the Quran, there is always the option for maghfirah. <coughs> There's always the option of pardon and forgiveness. Verse number six, beautiful verse, wonderful verse. The verse still applies until today. وَإِنْ أَحَدٌ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ اسْتَجَارَكَ فَأَجِرْ If any of the mushriks seek your protection, protect them. حَتَّى يَسْمَعَ كَلَامَ اللَّهِ This is a wonderful ayah. If a mushrik comes up to you and says, to, uh, and says listen, I need your help. I need your protection. I've done nothing wrong. I don't even know about your religion. I've heard certain things. Give them protection until he hears the words of Allah. Compare this to ISIS. Dawaish one side. Look at Quran on the other. Do you know, I remember, do you know this ayah, do you know what I remember it? Wallah. It brings back memories of a story. Khawarij. Nahrawan. You know what they used to do? They would kill you on the Hawiya. Hawitak, Shi'i, Ali, kill. If your Hawiya, your ID card said Mushrik, would they kill you? No. Why? If your identity card said Shi'a of Ali, death. ISIS, Al Qaeda. Sipa Sahaba, Lashkar Jangvi, ID killing. Mushrik? No. Abdullah, the son of Khabbab ibn al Arat. Khabbab ibn al Arat was a companion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. His son Abdullah was with his pregnant wife. They were walking. One of the Khawarij, you know, they stop at their checkpoints. Exactly the same thing you saw. Syria, Iraq, same thing you see in history. Repeats itself. At the checkpoint, stopped. Before them, there was a mushrik. What's your idea, mushrik? Go. You, Abdullah ibn al-Khabbab, what are you? You said, Ali ibn al-Talib. You said, okay. Your wife, Shia Ali? Okay. They slayed the wife, stum took the baby out and threw her in the river. He asked them, how comes I, how comes the mushriks going away? Me and my wife I have got this punishment coming to us. He said, the Quran says, وَإِنْ أَحَدٌ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ اسْتَجَارَكْ فَأَجِرْهِ Father Mushrik, Quran says, if they seek your help, 
or they seek your protection, give them. Hatta yasma kalam Allah. So that person, we've given protection. He said, I'm a Muslim. <laughs> what is a Shi'i? And that I believe that of all the people. After Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there's none higher than Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. That's a Shi'i. You may believe there's none higher than so-and-so. You may believe there's none higher than so-and-so. I'm still a Muslim. I believe la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. They killed Abdullah ibn al-Khabbab. They killed his wife. This ayah, what did it say? You go into Mecca. We don't give you a carte blanche. Go and kill everybody who's mushrik. Those people who have made a covenant with you, you give them their rights. And those who don't know about Islam, Baba, there are people. Their image of Islam is one thing. Let them meet you. Let them talk to you. Explain to them the Quran. وَإِنْ أَحَدٌ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ سَجَارَكَ فَأَجَرْ حَتَّى يَسْمَعَ كَلَامَ اللَّهِ ثُمَّ أَبْلِغْهُ مَأْمَنَا then after that, you give him his place of safety. Why? Baba, what do they know? They don't know about your prophet. They've heard there's a man called Muhammad lives in Medina. I mean, many of these people didn't see Rasulullah because he left 10 years before. There were many young ones who have never met Rasulullah. Let them come and talk to you. And it also shows that Allah doesn't want blind faith. Allah wants people who are shown who talk, who ask questions, who believe. So therefore, the verses are violent, but the context is interesting. Then there is one more passage, and I will conclude. Surah 8, everybody at home. Verse number 55 of the Quran. Here Allah shows that, look, treaties are made. If they're broken, everyone rationally in their convention will appreciate that in rational convention you make a treaty, with people, and if these people break them, then there are certain laws which have to be administered. Because in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions here, الَّذِينَ أَحَدْتَ Verse 56 of Surah Al-Anfal, Surah 8. الَّذِينَ أَحَدْتَ مِنْهُمْ ثُمَّ يَنْقُضُونَ أَحْدَهُمْ فِي كُلِّ مَرَّةٍ وَهُمْ لَا يَتَّقُونَ You make a covenant with them every time you make an agreement with them. Baba, إحنا المسلمين, let us live in peace. They break that agreement. What happens with them? Verse, 50, uh, verse 57. فَإِمَّا Either you take them in fighting. Who? Either you take them fighting. Scatter them by punishing them, making an example of them. However, if you fear treachery from a people, then do what? Throw them back unto their covenant on evil term, on equal terms. Okay? Make a deal with them again. And then in verse number 60, it's very important. Okay? Here the Quran says that you prepare for war. Frighten the enemy of the opposition. And then the Quran says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you victory. But in verse 61, this is huge my dear brothers and sisters. Verse 61. But if they lean to peace, Allah. Even if they are your most vicious enemies. And I don't know. If in the Muslim world this still applies, I don't know. That if a group of people are your most vicious enemies, the moment you think of peace, everyone's like, Astaghfirullah, Allah, we'll never make peace with them, we'll kill them, we'll burn them, we'll hide. I don't know. The Quran seemingly has a different worldview. The Quran tells you that if they lean to peace, in what should you do? Fajnah laha. So when it says, وَإِنْ جَنَحُوا لِلْسَلْمِ What should we do? فَاجْنَحْ لَهَا وَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ إِنَّهُ هُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ The Quran here is saying to us something clear. If a group of people who are your enemies are trying to make peace with you, even if they've broken their covenants, try and lean to peace if they lean to peace as well. Sometimes you might hear that there might be a person or two countries, they hate each other. If one of them calls out for peace and the other one is adamant they won't have, 
maybe one can look at the Quran and say, are you worse than, are they worse than the Quraysh? And are you greater than Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi? For Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, Allah instructs him that if you're able to find peace, even with those who have oppressed you all this time, then try and look for that peace. Last ayah, my dear brothers and sisters, Surah 5, verse number 33. Many people, when they look at these ayahs, 32 and 33 of Surah 5, they're like, Sayyidina, these are violent ayahs. Surah Al-Ma'idah, ayah 32, Surah 5, verse number 32 and 33 of the Quran. Verse 32 is every Muslim's cop-out verse. They love the, this verse in particular. For this reason, من أجل ذلك كتبنا على بني إسرائيل أنه من قتل نفسا بغير نفس Muslims always quote this ayah. They say that we prescribe to the children of Israel whoever kills one man then it's as if they've killed the whole of Humanity. But the reality is the ayah doesn't say whoever kills one man, they've killed the whole of humanity. The ayah says whoever kills one man, unless it's because that person has done murder or mischief. <laughs> so Muslims, when they say, Baba, you know, in our belief, if you kill one person, you kill the whole of humanity. No, the ayah says if you kill one person, you, it's as if you kill the whole of humanity. Unless that person has committed murder, then there's retaliation. Let's not take it out of context. But the next ayah, the next ayah is vicious. إنما جزاء الذين يحاربون الله ورسوله ويسعون في الأرض فسادا أن يقتلوا أو يصلبوا أو تقطع أيديهم وأرجلهم من خلاف أو ينفوا من الأرض Those who wage war against God and his messenger um, they strive to make mischief in the land. Okay, this is how we deal with them. We kill them or we crucify them or we cut off their hands and feet from opposite sides. Or we banish them from the earth. Islam, religion of peace. Those who wage war against the Prophet of God. Uh, problem with this type of ayah is ISIS uses it, Al Qaeda uses it, this one uses it, that one. Because they're like, listen, uh, you wage war, you Rawafid. Or person can say, you Salafis wage war. You people wage war. And the Quran says, إِنَّمَا جَسَاءُ الَّذِينَ يُحَارِبُونَ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولَ وَيَسْعَوْنَ فِي الْأَرْضِ فَسَادَ يُقَتَّلُوا أَوْ يُصَلَّبُوا أَوْ تُقَطَّعَ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَأَرْجُلُهُمْ مِنْ خِلَافٍ أَوْ يُنْفُوا مِنَ الْأَرْضِ ذَلِكَ لَهُمْ خِزْجٌ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَلَهُمْ فِي الْآخِرَةِ عَذَابٌ عَظِيمٌ How do I explain to my non-Muslim friend this ayah? My dear brothers and sisters, I will not explain this ayah to you because you at times also have to do your own homework. When a verse in the Quran says to you that you can kill, no, crucify, no, chop off their hands and feet, no, banish them from the earth, it's your responsibility to go back and read your holy book and find the answer. I'm not going to give it to you. But I will see you inshallah tomorrow. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. <laughs> preservation and the propagation of the message of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Indeed, one of the best ways to work towards the reappearance of Imam al-Mahdi ajalallah ta'ala faraju sharif is through promoting the values of Karbala. Imam Hussein Media Group is the only Shia television network that broadcasts globally in five different languages, Arabic, Farsi, Turkish, Urdu, and English. We are appealing to the lovers of Imam Hussein alayhi salam worldwide to support the channel such that it may continue its global operations. 
Imam Hussein Media Group is seeking 1,000 partners to pledge to a 14 pound contribution per month. This will allow the channel to sustain its operating costs as we continue to spread the message of Imam Hussein alayhi salam in multiple languages across the globe. You be a part of this great legacy and donate today. You can pledge in two ways. www.imamhussein3.tv slash donate will take you direct to our donation page where you can pledge monthly. Or you can call or WhatsApp us on 0044-793-991763. Imam Hussein TV, your gateway to Karbala. Bye.